to be out of here at, right at six. Uh, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and, and stay on schedule for today. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, my name is Laura Brower Higgood. I'm the executive director of the DC History Center, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to this final session of the 50th DC History Conference. I hope you've had an amazing time. Very last session, a little sad, <laughs> crime and how Washingtonians have fought back with um, a preeminent DC historian, Kyla Summers. It's fair to say that this is a timely topic in Washington. At the DC History Center, we believe that our city's history sheds light on the most pressing and urgent issues we face as a community today. History is not past, it is present. Uh, and this session especially illustrates that idea. We're usually based in the Carnegie Library, just a few blocks away from here on Mount Vernon Square. And um, there you'll find our Kiplinger Research uh, Library and all of our historic collections. If you've never visited us before, I really welcome you uh, to come see us. We're open Thursday through Sunday. Um, also, you'll, among our public programs, this DC History Conference, of course, uh, but we do K through 12 work and community engagement. There's really, um, so please check us out at dzhistory.org, and if you haven't already, sign up for our email. Please check us out at dzhistory.org, and if you haven't already, sign up for our email newsletter, because uh, we look forward to welcoming you to, to our community. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and welcome Lopez Matthews, who is the DC State Archivist and Public Records Administrator uh, for the District of Columbia. So we were just saying, a big job. <laughs> um, um, Lopez sits on the Conference Planning Committee and helped shape the content of this year's outstanding program. Thank you so much, Lopez. All right for the planning committee for the conference. And one of our goals for this 50th anniversary DC History Conference was to develop a program that showcases the mosaic that is Washington, DC. A program that highlights both the unique cultural experiences and the collective experiences of everyone in DC. That proves, as our government motto states, we are DC. If you can see my pen, that's what it says, we are DC. And so, without further ado, because we do have a brief amount of time, I'm going to introduce our speaker, Kyla Summers. And Kyla Summers earned her PhD in history from the George Washington University. Her writing has appeared in the Washington Post, the Washington History Journal, digital engagement editor at American Oversight, and was previously when the smoke cleared by the new press, and she lives in Washington, D.C., so she is a part of this great mosaic. And so without further ado, please welcome Kyla Summers. Hello. Um, thank you so much to the D.C. History Center and the conference for asking me to give this presentation. I had the pleasure of being the fellow all the way back in 2016 at the DC History Center. And this photo is actually me doing archival work there. And the document in the far right hand cor lower corner is congressional testimony that I'll actually be reading in part today. Um, so you can see how this great DC Center has really directed my scholarship. I also spent right before it closed down for this absolutely stunning renovation. These two institutions that play, flew halfway across the country to be here, Bright and Melody Summers. <laughs> their neighbor that they were coming to DC, their neighbor told them to be careful because DC is a dangerous city and to not go out at night. So today I'm gonna talk to you about another time, and I know that's anecdotal, but it still is a demonstration of how crime in DC has become a national conversation. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about another time in DC history when, to quote the Washington Afro-American in 1969, crime has become a major preoccupation of Washington residents. The danger of being robbed, raped, mugged, or murdered now surpasses sex and even politics as a topic of conversation. This is how Southern segregationists politicized DC crime in the wake of the Brown versus Board dis, um, education decision. Second, how Richard Nixon politicized DC crime to win the White House and push his tough on crime agenda in DC and across the country. And finally, how DC leaders fought back. <laughs> 
I hope you will walk away with some and use to adopt policies that can do more harm than good. So let's start with DC in the 1950s. The Supreme Court overturns the Brown, or <laughs> decides the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954. And although this decision does mandate school desegregation, most of the time schools across the South are slow to comply. It often takes years or even up to a decade for even the very first token forms of integration. The Supreme Court decision comes in May 1954, and DC was trying to be savvy politically. He, as the president, wants to enforce the rule of law. He doesn't want to undermine the Supreme Court, but he also doesn't want to upset Southern segregationists who insist that this is a state's rights issue. But DC is not a state, is less upsetting to Southerners. So DC is the first to integrate and becomes a test case for integration. While Eisenhower argued that DC showed the test worked and was a positive model for the rest of the country, others, like Georgia Congressman James Davis, believed that the district was actually a cautionary tale. In 1956, Davis led a special subcommittee of the House D.C. Committee, which it's important to note, at this time, D.C. is almost entirely under congressional control. There's a committee on D.C. in the House of Representatives. There's a committee on D.C. in the Senate, which is still the case today. It's just that at the time, those two committees had even more power. So through that House committee, he has a special subcommittee that investigates integration in D.C schools. An attorney with the hearings asked teachers leading questions to suggest that black children were a safety concern to white children. Back against the narrative the hearings were pushing. The head of the NAACP in DC thought the hearings relied so heavily on distorted and racist ideas that he called them unhooded Klan meetings. The Washington Post slammed the hearings as a hatchet job. Many teachers defended desegregation, and the assistant superintendent called it a miracle of social adjustment. But Davis, oh, but Davis's hearing served his purpose, and the subcommittee sent hearing transcripts and distorted reports to schools across the South in the hopes that the school districts could use this purported information on the, quote, tragic results which come from the breakdown of segregationist states' rights council in 1956. Davis directly connected his concerns about school integration to concerns about crime, saying, among the many other reasons why the white people object to their children having this close association with Negro children are the Negro's high crime rate and the disrespect for the law. Washington is noted for the great number of serious crimes committed in its limits. Negroes are responsible for this high crime rate. But Davis was far from the only person to draw attention to crime in DC post-Brown. In 1956, groups called white uh, citizens associations, which are all white neighborhood groups that were some of the staunchest defenders of segregation, asked Congress for more police because residents were afraid to go out at night. In 1957, a famous author named Willie Snow Etheridge was mugged in DC right off Connecticut Avenue. She wrote in a national magazine that, quote, it is a disgrace that the citizens of these United States can't walk the streets of their capital without fear of being mugged by hoodlums. In 1958, two members of Congress recommended companies of Marines patrol DC to ensure safety. And in 1959, Senator Robert Byrd, who was the head of the Senate Committee on DC for a long time, commented that people reading the newspaper, quote, might well form the opinion that this city is a half-civilized place where it is unsafe to venture into the streets at night. But this sensationalized concern over crime was often completely disconnected from reality. 
In 1956, the same year the Citizens Associations asked for more police presence because they were afraid to go out at night, DC crime had decreased by nearly 20% over three years. In 1957, the year Willie Etheridge was mugged, the DC crime rate was 10% lower than that and was one of the lowest in the country. As late as 1961 and 1962, crime in DC was consistent with national averages and had still decreased from the year before. So why was there this discrepancy between reality and perception? DC became a majority black city in 1957. So it was no coincidence that white Washingtonians reported feeling less safe and believed that the district was one of the most dangerous places in the country. This stems from the deep-seated, pervasive, and racist American inclination to associate blackness with danger and crime. The rampant fear of crime, despite low crime statistics, also persisted because segregationists knew this fear was politically useful. Southern lawmakers claimed that crime in DC was the outcome of integration and proved that African Americans were dangerous and thus less deserving of civil rights. For example, in 1959, a South Carolina senator made speeches in Congress almost daily connecting integration to crime because he claimed newspapers failed to report the, quote, chronic ailments that accompany forced integration. A Louisiana senator asserted in 1963 that DC crime proved, quote, his contention that Negroes cannot govern themselves. As a Washington Post journalist concluded in 1964, the vision of Washington as a hotbed of rapine and bloodshed has been disseminated by congressmen who view the crime rate as the predictable and deserved reward of racial desegregation. The heightened concern over DC crime also provided a platform to criticize recent Supreme Court decisions. The police claimed these court rulings that granted citizens more civil liberties made their jobs impossible and would result in rampant crime. And it's important to note that a lot of people have done studies and this was not the case. Things like the Miranda rights or the Mallory decision did not increase crime in the area. But, for example, in 1963, the DC police chief insisted the police department didn't need any more officers, they needed fewer restrictions and new powers such as preventative arrests. Many in Congress supplemented these calls for additional police power with demands for a harsher criminal justice system and other law and order measures. At hearings on crime in 1963, members of Congress advocated measures such as building more prisons, establishing reform schools, instituting mandatory minimum sentences, and even having physical punishment in schools and courts. Police officers and politicians also insisted that any effort to hold police accountable or restrict their power would backfire and result in higher crime. In a 1967 report, uh, DC police asserted that they couldn't do their jobs because of, quote, extravagant charges of brutality and misconduct. A Virginia congressman charged that investigations in department to ban officers from using racial slurs or calling black men boy. So, after desegregation, Southern segregationists in Congress spotlighted crime in the Capitol, bringing national attention to the issue and helping them delay integration, undermine civil rights reforms, and rally white voters to support tough on crime policies. This view of crime and the proposed solutions did not go unchallenged, however. Black newspapers and activists emphasized the racism embedded in the crime panic. For example, a 1959 editorial in the Washington Afro-American noted a double standard on how crime was treated depending on its location in the city and how it could be used politically. All the cars also highlighted the many problems that accompany unfettered police power and the disproportionate ways it affected black Washingtonians. <laughs> 
Activist Julius Hobson meticulously documented the police department's hiring discrimination, and in the mid-1960s, his organization distributed 15,000 questionnaires to DC residents to ask them about the police. The responses revealed overwhelming resentment against the police department because of how often black people were mistreated by officers. Hobson himself observed that the police officers have raised a continuing cry for more authority, more right to make neighborhoods. And just this is Julius Hobson, the fellow with the um, pipe in this photo. Yet despite this nearly unchecked power, many in Congress were preoccupied with expanding police power and protecting officers from any criticism or oversight. To quote Hobson again, Congress wails that Washington streets are unsafe. Indeed they are, for any colored person found walking them late at night. Congress leads a chorus of cries for more protection by the police, while the poor plead for protection from the police. Both of these cries intensified during and in the wake, however, that by the late 1950s is about a crime wave that was, in, and the early 60s, is about a crime wave that was essentially fabricated. By the time we're in the late um, 60s, this is very much real. Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated on April 4th, 1968. I'm just gonna very brief his podcast, my book, that go into this in great detail. But what's important to know is that after King was assassinated, centuries of racial discrimination and oppression erupted into, with grief and anger into protests in more than 100 cities across the United States. The worst by every measure in terms of the number of people arrested, the damage across DC, and the number of federal troops called in to quell the rebellion was in Washington, DC. Federal, on uh, Friday, April 5th, which many consider to be the height of the rebellion, more than 500 fires were burning simultaneously across the city. The um, heart of the, of the destruction was along 14th Street Northwest, 7th Street Northwest, 8th Street Northeast, and then other pockets of businesses in black neighborhoods across the city. Um, there's a lot to be said about the police and federal troops' response to this, but for today I'm going to briefly say that despite all of the faults, it was much more mild than what had happened in 1967 in Detroit, and there was a conscious decision to prioritize human life over private property. So for example, in Detroit in 1967, the federal troops fired more than 156,000 rounds of ammunition. In DC in 1968, they fired 14 total. That's not 14,000, that is 14 compared to 156,000. But it's also important to note that for many people, especially people in the suburbs, these rebellions were not protests, as I argue, but they were mass crime events of people setting fires and taking goods, and their approach in the aftermath reflected that belief. Many Americans avoided cities altogether after the rebellions. In the Washington suburbs, the Fairfax School District placed an indefinite ban on school trips to DC following the unrest. Hotel and restaurant business in DC was 25% lower in April 68 than the year before, and it was 20% lower that May. 800,000 fewer people visited the major tourist attractions in DC in April 68 than the year before. Efforts to attract visitors were undermined by some members of Congress who urged their constituents to avoid the Capitol. I would not be sensitive to my responsibility as a member of the Congress if I failed to warn my constituents that they should not run them out to the car to me because they were too afraid to actually go into the restaurant. The DC Central Library, which at the time was located where the DC um, history is an aside because I'm currently in a great DC library. Uh, one of the really interesting things that I found when I was doing my research in the annual library reports was that librarians talked about there was a huge increase in demand for literature on black history and civil rights. 
like they had in the previous decade, leaders demanded the same tough-on-crime measures to combat crime, calling for federal intervention, military occupation, and even dictatorship in the wake of the rebellions. Senator Robert Byrd encouraged federal troops to stay indefinitely because the presence of federal troops would be reassuring, he thought. In May, broadcast company WMAL supported Byrd's proposal. Quote, semi-martial law is not a pleasant idea, but there seems little choice. A lot of scholars have written about this reaction in 1968, the white backlash that led to Richard Nixon's election and law and order agenda. But what has been far less studied as part of the legacy of 68 is how the communities directly affected by the uprisings responded. And while these communities assuredly did not want high crime rates, they also did not think, they also did not see that as incompatible with reforming the police department to restrict police power and give the community more control over law enforcement. And this is the like today, deaths of black people at the hands of police officers were a major problem and a rallying cry for accountability and change. DC police shot and killed 17 people between January 1967 and October 1968. On, in July, a police officer killed Theodore Lawson, a black man, at the corner of 14th and U Streets Northwest. In response, the DC City Council created a commission to propose specific solutions. City Council Chairman John Heckinger said, what is needed now in this city, not additional hearings. In creating the report, the committee consulted with the local ACLU, the Black United Front, which was an umbrella organization of black groups created by Stokely Carmichael, and members of the community whose written and spoken feedback the committee solicited. And this is another really big part of the legacy coming out from 68, which is how frequently um, the DC government solicited input from the community and directly incorporated that um, input into their policy proposals. The resulting report concluded that improved police community relations were a prerequisite to an effective police force and safe streets. Quote, unless relationships between the police and major elements of the community improve, it is difficult to see how the current high rates of crime, which threaten the well-being of the city, can be substantially reduced. The report encouraged community influence and input, noted the need to better handle citizens' complaints about the police, and urged the department to hire more black police officers. That August, the DC City Council adopted the report as a statement of policy. Then, in October, a white police officer killed another black man, Elijah Bennett, allegedly for jaywalking. At a rally held at the New School for Afro-American Thought, black leaders condemned, once again, this unchecked police power. How many times are you going to watch your brothers being shot in the streets, asked Julius Hobson. Citizens from the community and one police officer to hear complaints about officers. This gave the community substantially more input over the police. The legislation also created a precinct advisory board made up of seven, seven citizens and two officers. This board would interview new officers before they were hired for their precinct. It would also have get to interview officers before they received a promotion. And it also gave a formal channel um, to give advice to the police captain, other officers, and even the mayor. The legislation was grounded in the idea that citizens should have some control over policing in their community and was an early attempt at creating a civilian review board. In 1968 and today, many departments deal with misconduct internally. If a police officer is accused of wrongdoing, it is other officers that investigate and decide how to deal with that officer. This process is embedded with significant bias that creates a lack of accountability. Civilian review boards grant oversight capabilities to people who are not part of the police, although many boards are limited by a lack of enforcement. That fall, the DC Council also passed a measure that changed the circumstances under which a police officer could, just, could shoot their gun. The new regulations required warning shots, firing from a moving vehicle, and unless in only a very few specific circumstances, couldn't shoot to apprehend someone fleeing a scene. 
Had these measures been in place, the D.C. Council believed that six out of the 17 recent shootings would have been prohibited, others would have been subject to invested times, the national average, and a near constant talking point. This was especially the case because as these measures were being considered, Richard Nixon was using crime in D.C. as a campaign issue. In the 1968 presidential election, Nixon famously pronounced him the law and order candidate and argued that the national crime rates proved that President Johnson's liberal agenda had failed. What a lot of people don't know is that Nixon gave special attention to DC, alleging that Johnson bore direct responsibility for crime and the uprisings in the Capitol. Washington DC is the one city in this country where the federal government is the agency responsible for law enforcement. It is the one city in America where crime statistics give a precise reading of a national administration's concern over the national crime crisis, he claimed. After the Democratic presidential nominee Hubert Humphrey said he was proud of the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, Nixon responded, is he proud of the fact that under this administration a violent mob burned down a great section of America's capital, something that hasn't been done to Washington since British troops left 155 years ago? On the campaign trail, Nixon repeatedly called Washington the crime capital of the world, and which was not true. It was not the crime. It was did not have the worst crime rates in the world, um, and used it as the prime example of why get tough policies were needed. Crimes are committed almost routinely, he said. When I see a congressional or Senate secretary cannot work at night unless she is escorted home, I say we need new leadership which can sweep the nation's capital streets clear. In another instance, he pledged that, quote, a Nixon administration will make it a first order of business to sweep the streets of Washington free of these prowlers and muggers and marauders and restore freedom from fear to the nation's capital. Nixon also framed D.C. as a testing ground for his law and order initiatives that would shape national policy. Washington, D.C., quote, should be a model city as far as law enforcement is concerned, a national laboratory in which the latest in crime prevention and detection can be tested and the results reported to a waiting nation. Nixon pushed for a larger police force, more arrests, speedier trials, and a less, quote, permissive system. These steps would help make D.C., quote, a model for the cities of this nation and an example to the world. In November 1968, Americans narrowly elected Richard Nixon to the presidency, and he quickly made D.C. the cornerstone of this law and order agenda. But before Nixon was even officially in office, his election to the presidency chilled the police reforms that the D.C. Council had passed that fall. It's important to note at this point that DC's governing bodies, with the exception of the school board, were all appointed by the president. In 1967, Johnson um, put in a system that allowed the president instead of Congress to appoint, that's when you get Mayor Commissioner Walter Washington, and you also get the 11 person city council that I showed before. But ev not a single one of them were elected. Every single one was appointed by the president. This, I think, largely ex explains why Mayor Walter E. Washington, who needed Nixon to reappoint him as mayor, mayor, stymied the council's efforts. Even though the city council had passed legislation to create community review boards, Mayor Washington considered those just recommendations and did not actually enact them. Mayor Washington also vetoed the, pol the new police regulations that limited when officers could fire their guns with a substantially weaker bill. The council fell one vote short of overturning that veto, but ultimately they passed the weaker version of the bill in January 1969. But things only got worse once Nixon was in office. Less than a week after his inauguration in January 1969, Nixon announced a war on crime in the district that proposed measures he described as a model crime package. Many of these proposals were included in the 1970 crime bill, which Nixon signed into law that summer. The bill incorporated much of the long-standing agenda of conservatives to reduce the rights of the accused after liberal Supreme Courts had expanded those rights. For example, the law pioneered techniques such as preventive detention, preventive 
active dis detention, which is detaining people who had not been found guilty of a crime without bail for as long as two months, enhanced the police power to surveil citizens through wiretaps, and legalized no-knock raids so the police could enter homes without a warrant or announcing their purpose. And this political cartoon is from the Washington Afro-American that summer, and it's demonstrating the potential if someone is barging into your home without more likelihood of that um, turning fatal. The legislation required mandatory minimum sentences for armed offenses and created harsher standardized punishments for other crimes. The bill also restructured DC's courts, allowing Nixon to appoint 13 new judges. DC courts had primarily been conservative before, or liberal before, and now with this influx, the, um, the political composition of those courts changed for decades to come. Walter Fontroy, who was a civil rights leader here and also the, at the time the vice chairman of the city council, characterized the DC crime bill as the cutting edge of fascism and oppression in the United States. The Washington Afro-American opined that while it knew the crime situation was bad, quote, officials are grabbing at straws. Holding people because they will probably commit a crime is probably unconstitutional. The NAACP's Roy Wilkins wrote that, quote, in Washington, no matter how it is lorded over with statistics, the district unfair detention and persecution, as well as the wholesale branding of a race. Nixon wielded his power over the Capitol and worked to make D.C. a model city for crime prevention in additional ways. In January 1970, the president summoned D.C.'s deputy mayor to the White House and told him that if he couldn't reduce crime by May, he would replace the entire city government. Days later, Mayor Washington announced a project to strengthen the criminal justice system. And this is Mayor Washington walking with police um, around that time. During Nixon's tenure, almost one-eighth of the nationwide budget for the law enforcement assistance agencies went to D.C., resulting in the highest rate of police to citizens in the world. D.C. Police Chief Jerry Wilson, at the president's request, toured the country to discuss the methods used by D.C. police and the success Nixon believed they had achieved. In his 1972 re-election campaign, Nixon touted his law and order program in D.C. But despite these claims that law and order worked in Washington, crime rates were still rising. In 1974, the number of murders in D.C. reached a new high, and gun violence became the leading cause of death for men under the age of 40. In 1975, a commission created by Mayor Washington found that 20% of men in D.C. and an astonishing 45% of women said they never went out alone at night program against the opposition of many black Washingtonians program against the opposition of many black Washingtonians Nixon imposed tough on crime policies on DC that disproportionately harmed its black residents Nixon funneled federal funds to the DC police and sent the police chief on a national tour with prescribed talking points even though crime rates did not go down in Washington, Nixon based national anti-crime legislation on DC's crime bill, and we're still seeing the damage inflicted by these policies unfolding today. But DC did try another way. As Nixon proposed growing police forces to sweep the streets of Washington clean, the DC City Council passed legislation to limit the police's use of firearms and launched initiatives to grant citizens more control over law enforcement. After the 1970 crime bill passed, Washington's, Washingtonians fiercely criticized its harsh measures. Even though most of these attempts to curb police authority failed, the efforts of a majority black city deserve consideration, especially as Americans continue to grapple with the dual crises of racial inequality and police brutality. While most are more familiar with what wipes, with this narrative of white suburbanites and conservative politicians' responses to the 1968 rebellions, studying the people who oppose those ideas shifts our historical understanding away from the dominant white narrative and shows other possibilities. Of course, this history is incredibly relevant today because crime in D.C. has once again become a national political story and an inescapable discussion. <laughs>
Just last year, dozens of Democrats in Congress crossed party lines to pass a bill overturning a D.C. law that modernized the district's criminal code and reduced maximum sentences for some crimes. President Biden signed it into law last March. Politicians and pundits praised this stunning denial of democracy as a victory for public safety. Senate M Minority Leader Mitch McConnell defended overturning D.C. policy by criticizing and patronizing D.C. elected officials. When the soft on crime local government has become this completely incompetent, then it's about time our federal government provides some adult supervision. Some have even used this moment to encourage stripping D.C. of home rule. So let me emphasize three points here that we can take from this history. First, crime in the capital has been politicized regardless of whether crime rates are high or not. Second, this politicized crime panic has been used to block civil rights reforms and push tough on crime measures that have historically not worked. Next, DC's own efforts to reform its police have routinely been blocked by Congress. Until we have statehood or at least way less congressional control, these reform efforts will not be able to reach their full potential. And finally, citizens and the DC Council challenged the widespread understanding of American crime and policing and demanded different urban policing policies. They prioritized black people's frustrations with police overreach over demands to reduce crime. Instead of criminalizing black people, some DC leaders were willing to address their grievances. And with that, I think we can take some questions. All right, folks, we're gonna take some questions and Autumn and I are gonna run the mics. Just very quickly, questions and in question marks. They are not statements or reflections about this work. <laughs> They're also not um, statements or reflections on your own research. If you want to engage in that conversation, we can do so as we're exiting the library promptly at six o'clock. So with that shared understanding, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Hi, Carla, thank you again. And I, I actually asked you this question once before, and I'm just so fascinated with this, I'm gonna actually ask it again, ask you to explain it again. Tell us about the photo that's used in the cover of your book. Yes, um, this is the gentleman pointing, this is Rufus Catfish Mayfield, who is still alive today, and he was one of the original founders of Pride, Inc which is a program also created by Marion Barry um, that gave DC youth summer jobs. Um, and it received funding from the Department of Labor and it's often, and it, I think a version of it still continues today, but it's really considered one of the a, like landmark DC government program. So um, his, he was called Catfish. He was instrumental in that being founded. This is from a protest of one of the police killings that in summer, I think this is actually in 67. Um, but I really like it because I think his pointing is so powerful. You also see the younger boys kind of centered around him as he's leading. But it's also interesting because after, one of the things that I couldn't get to about the rebellions is that you know more than 6,000 people are arrested as part of this and it's just pure pandemonium at the courts. Um, they were like, there's actually like a pretty um, involved process to arrest someone and book them and all that. But when you're flooded with 6,000 people that wasn't really working, it also meant that all these people needed lawyers to defend them. So a ton of volunteers from all over the city came to volunteer to help. But it was a, some people would refuse to give their real names. And so they were being detained because they wouldn't give their names. and. Um, Catfish went in and talked to all these people and got them to agree, um, essentially worked out like, I, not like a plea deal, but like said, they will let you go, like you can trust us, you can give us your names, and was able to help alleviate um, some of those issues with the administration of justice. But then he also continued to be really active with DC politics and protest in the week. So that is what that photo is. Thanks for asking, Ra. Oh, hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, 
when it comes to how crime in DC is discussed, I, it's a joke I have with my friends where it's usually like framed as like the audacity to commit crime without being affiliated with, an, with a corporation. And so when, I guess it's like when you were studying about, you know, to create the stuff in your book, did you see like any like breakdown of, or like theory discussing what, how people were defining crime hmm. and what kind of crimes were being discussed? Because I have like a history of like in high school dealing with a lot of like drug abuse amongst teenagers and binge drinking that was really dangerous, but then it's treated as a health concern, a public health concern for some and as a crime for others. Yes. I think the definition of what crime is is definitely in flux depending on who the victim is and um, the circum, you know, who committed it a lot of the time or where in the city it even happened. Um, I remember all the, you know, DC crime rates were quite low in the mid, like 2015, but I remember there was a white congressional staffer who was murdered that summer, which is obviously a tragedy, but the attention on that murder, because it was a white victim um, who was not of, you know, not associated with crime, um, was far, like 10 times more than any other crime that are, we consider almost routine here, right, which is murders of young black men. So it really is, it's still to this day incredibly racialized, and what I've noticed is it's very rare that when we're talking about, you know, the, even though people will cite the overall murder statistics as a form of decrying crime in D.C., that's not what they're experiencing personally. What they're afraid of is often pettier crimes, right, like being mugged or um, the carjackings, because those are the, the crimes that a lot of white people are actually afraid of being victims of, less of the crime that goes on in Ward 7 and 8. So I think it's still to this day incredibly racialized, incredibly um, specific to location, and um, even the economic status of the people that you're talking about. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, can you clarify how, if Nixon was so eager to use DC as a laboratory and to tout it in his, what he was doing, how home rule ended up getting passed not that much later? So I'm not a home rule expert. I really do pretty much end with 73 um, in my research. But I do know that it, um, it's less, Nixon signs it into law. It's more that Nixon doesn't veto it instead of he's like a champion of it. So what does happen is in the 60s with all of the civil rights reforms, including the Voting Rights Act, black people in the South actually have voting power. And the, the reason that DC home rule had been held up for so long was Southern segregationists who were on the DC committee in Congress, including very famously John McMillan. And John McMillan, A, was a racist. When Mayor Washington became the mayor, he sent, and he sent the first um, budget to the Congress, McMillan sent him a bunch of watermelons in response. So he's just an outright racist. But he had been blocking for, I mean, at least a decade. Anytime someone pro would propose a bill to make, to give DC home rule, he would kill it. So what Walter Fontroy and others in DC did was realize that black people had voting power and they sent buses of people down to North Carolina, his district in North Carolina, primaried him got him to lose his primary, and then that meant that he lost the, he no longer, even though, and he was out of Congress, but it also opened up a new position for chairman of that committee, and um, I'm blanking on the name because I'm bad with names, but a young black congressman from Michigan, thank you, Diggs, was put in, and he and Walter Fontroy worked together to get the Home Rule Bill passed. So it's less, it's not really that Nixon like championed it, it's more that he just didn't veto it. Uh, phenomenal, um, great stuff. Uh, I Something that perturbs me when I watch the news and follow things is how um, black residents of DC, kids in DC get characterized um, in discussions around crime. And I was just curious to know, 
what you may have noticed in your research from 1957 through the 60s, through the 70s, even to today, um, how um, media characterizations of crime and notions of criminality have changed because what we deem socially acceptable um, and what you can say in the newspapers has changed, um, like the phrases that you can use specifically. So I just want you to, or, or want to know what you, you've noticed is stay the same and what has changed because the ideas have been around since 1619 whatever but what's changed in the papers in the news media um so one one of the first things that came to mind is when i talked about willie snow etheridge the author that was mugged um everyone assumed that the perpetrator was black, but they were actually white. And so after everyone was talking about, you know, black crime, black crime, she had to issue a correction to her story. Even, she never mentioned the race to say this was a white man, you know. So it's just, it gets to that idea that if, if a blank space is left, people will fill it with that, pre, with that stereotype. Um, and I think that that's a really vivid example. I, I don't know if I can give you a great answer off the top of my head. What I can say is that um, the constant reporting on crime, which I know that we do need, like I'm not saying that we should just act like it doesn't exist. Like you have to have knowledge about what's going on. But um, that can really, just seeing that over and over and over again really does build up this perception um, that really sticks with people in their head. The only other thing I'll say, I just is um, just a couple days ago there was uh, someone was murdered at the Brooklyn Metro Station, which is just right in my neighborhood. There's a 14 year old student. And um, the first tweet that I saw telling me about what had happened said critical shooting, someone shot in the head at the Brooklyn Station. And the last sentence of this tweet was, suspect was a fair evader. Like the information that we need about a murder is the fact that prior to the murder happening was that someone had skipped out on paying $2 for a metro ride. And so I think, I know that this isn't the best, is, but that tells you how we're still shaming children and we're still choosing to focus on certain details. Just like in 1957 when they're asking questions about integrated schools, they're asking, are black boys flirting with white girls? And there's a reason they're asking that question. When you see a tweet about a tragic murder, there's a reason someone is insisting that, were, that they were a fair invader in the first tweet of, about that crime. Thank you. All right, folks, we have time for one more question. Uh, thank you for this. Um, I'm wondering, you've done a lot of research on crime in the city historically. I'm wondering if you've had the opportunity to take some of that research and sort of overlay it to sort of space and place history. Uh, I'd be curious to hear any conversations you've had with folks about uh, spaces like Ward 7 and 8, which were historically segregated white communities, yes. uh, suffered disinvestment. DC sort of has its own little southern switch where Upper Northwest Washington is being developed, so on and so forth. And those areas don't have high rates of crime, but the areas that have sort of uh, inherited dilapidated infrastructure and in turn suffered disinvestment, so on and so forth, are the areas that are also inundated with uh, high rates of poverty and in turn high rates of crime. Thank you. Yes, and I think um, I, the bulk of my research has really been concentrated on the 60s because that is when the rebellions happen. Um, two things that I didn't get to talk about that I do talk a lot about in the book is one, Southwest urban renewal, which is in the, um, Southwest was at the time in the 50s a largely black working class community, and it was one of those neighborhoods where people had settled there in the aftermath of the Civil War. It was a really, there was a lot of black business. It was one of those places that if you were part of the great, great migration coming up to DC, you're, you had family there, and that's where you would first settle, and it was like a community hub. In the 1950s, the federal government raises 99% of that community, and those people are sent that's when a huge inflate of that population, a lot of them come to the very neighborhoods that are the 
center of the rebellions in 68. It's also a lot of them settle in Anacostia, and this is when you start to see that racial turnover in Anacostia. So I think, you know, Georgetown used to be a black working class neighborhood, right? Like it really, and it's so many of these demographic shifts are not just random, they're because of federal policy. And so I think you just see that time and time again. What I do talk a lot about in the book in the aftermath of 68 is the Shaw neighborhood being rebuilt because it's a really interesting example of they were the DC government was super determined to um, get as much citizen participation as possible. So they interview more than 50% of residents and they get like a really wide consensus on what they want to happen. The way it's gonna develop is between community groups and the DC government, not private development. I mean, it's this really cool proposal and then Nixon just decimates it. Um, and so I think, once again, it's, and then instead of doing community development, they sell off big chunks of land to private developers that sit on it for decades until things like the Metro, the Walter Reeves Center make those neighborhoods profitable and that's when private developers come in and you know develop those places. So I think it, I, yes, I have looked into the sum. I'm sorry I didn't get it um, into it more here, but it's a wonderful point. And I thank you for bringing it up. Um, thank you so much, Kyla. <laughs> really. Kyla, thank you so much for giving us such an important perspective on these issues in our community. Uh, we do have a special guest with us. I am very honored to introduce our, um, the chair of the DC Council, Phil Mendelson, is with us. Um, these are issues that he's contending with every day, and I'm excited to hear your perspective, Phil. Please join us. I'll try not to be too long. I came here to hear, to listen, and it was a fascinating presentation. I should start by saying good afternoon. Uh, I came here to listen to the presentation because I find crime one of the more difficult issues that we deal with in this city. This city is no different than any other city in this country in terms of the ups and downs of crime and how we try to deal with it and the causes of it were really no different. Uh, and yet we struggle and as you know over the past year there's been a whole lot in the news about crime in the city. Maybe not the crime capital but the crime crisis. And so I wanted to hear and I think it's important to understand the history or get some sense of history with this and that's what I wanted to hear. And I took away a couple of points, one of which is, and I knew this before, it's easy with crime to demagogue it. Crime, unlike most issues, just lends itself to demagoguery. You know, mandatory minimums, uh, the truth in sentencing, um, We've heard that over the years, and uh, even when crime isn't that great, in the 1950s, it still can be demagogued. The second takeaway for me, which I sort of knew before, is that Congress doesn't really care. Now, I don't mean by that to be bashing Congress, but Congress, members of Congress have their own reasons for, in this case, um, seizing on crime uh, over the past year, seizing on crime. Um, in the 50s, race, racism or segregation, uh, most, more recently, just the national politics of Republicans wanting to stay in office, and so it plays well to their constituencies to talk about how in democratic cities that crime is just off the charts, uh, and it doesn't really matter what the statistics are. So for instance, with the crime, the, uh, the uh, model revised, not model, the criminal code reform bill that probably many of you don't un fully understand, and I don't mean that as a criticism, but it really was similar to the model penal code, but so easy to take pieces of that and to say, oh look, we're, the city's being soft on crime. So when I testified before the House Committee a year ago, March of 2023, a couple of days before that testimony, there was a congressional staffer, I think uh, for Senator Rand, uh, Rand Paul, who had been assaulted on 8th Street, and I talked to the chair of our Criminal Code Revision Commission, who'd 
really was uh, behind drafting the legislation. Under the crime, the revised crime bill, the potential sentence for the perpetrator would be greater than under the current law. The sentence would be greater than under the current law, but that's not the rhetoric. The rhetoric is that we actually reduced sentencing, and that was why this was a bad bill. And to the Republicans, it doesn't really matter because we don't vote for them. Who votes for them are their constituents, and their constituents, it's quick for them to, to seize on the, the storyline that crime is out of control, there's a crime crisis in the district, and my congressman, my senator, is fighting for law and order in the nation's capital. It's just Congress doesn't care, and crime easily lends itself to be demagogued. Um, I, over the past year, have stepped up the efforts of the council to work with, thank you, to st stepped up the efforts of the council to work on the Hill, to be more present, to lobby on the Hill, and um, to push back against some of these measures which really aren't developed with any concern about what works in the city, because there are a lot of other, and a lot of them have to do with crime, actually getting rid of police accountability. A lot of that is motivated by the FOP because they don't like the fact that what the council did a few years, a few years ago in the wake of George Floyd's murder was we took away, we were one of the few cities in the country that took away from the police union the ability to bargain their discipline. That's at the root of a lot of the mischief up on the Hill, because the FOP doesn't like that. And so they've been criticizing a lot of the accountability provisions. What Congress has not done is they have not appointed the judges we need, so our court is, courts are about 20% vacant which means it's hard to have criminal trials. Uh, they continue to keep in place a rider prohibiting us from legislating, regulating cannabis in this city, which means we have a lot of illegal activity. And they continue. And they continue to underfund our police department. So. Thank you all. I went a little longer than I meant to, but thank you all, and thank you so much for the presentation. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Unfortunately, the library is closing, and so we'll need to close out this room. Thank you so much. It was great to see you. I hope you had a great conference.